on the phone, on the radio. From mouth to mouth carried the terrible news of the terrible danger looming over the 6th Army. For its headquarters, units and formations on November 19, a day stunning, a day of confusion. Events take a turn that no one expected and require immediate countermeasures. Nervousness threatens to turn into panic. For many, paralyzing their will and energy, a vision of the horsemen of the apocalypse arises before their eyes. I'm standing in the dugout of the Chief of Operations of the Division Headquarters. Tonight's airplane bomb blast here blew out the windows and blew out the stairs. With a concerned face, Lieutenant Colonel extends his hand to me, and after exchanging a brief greeting, explains the situation. After many days of inactivity and waiting yesterday, finally were refueled with gasoline reconnaissance planes. They immediately flew out for reconnaissance. The data was amazing. North of the Don detected the approach of an entire strike army with tanks and cavalry divisions. A few bombs dropped by the scouts hit the target, but of course could not cause much damage. The headquarters of the 6th Army immediately appealed to the higher command for help, but it was too late. This morning there was a disaster. Here, Lieutenant Colonel pointed to the map, on the section Kletskaya Serafimovich, the enemy managed to realize a deep breakthrough. Exactly on the Romanian section, which has a pathetic anti-tank defense, at the moment there is fighting everywhere, so there is no clear picture and the final conclusion cannot be made. Troops have already moved in to eliminate the breakthrough. I know that. Let's hope they succeed. Then we'll see what's next. Army Group Command will help us. That's clear. For our division, everything remains the same. Continue to equip the occupied positions, strengthen them, hold them at all costs. Everything remains the same for us. It says very little. In fact, nothing. Do you know, my dear fellow, what it means? It means that we will have to continue to sit under the ruins of the ruined city, in cold cellars, in dark workshops, where we have to huddle together, because there is almost nothing to heat us. The furnace is rarely heated. Besides, it attracts the howling death that will extinguish it and our lives. Everything is the same means to live without daylight for many weeks, when only at night, occasionally, you can breathe fresh air, look at the cold silver moon and the blue snow. But the brutal frost, penetrating to the bone, forces the cave dwellers to go back down into the protective bosom of the earth. Winter uniforms have not arrived, and the ordinary ones, which are completely unsuitable for winter, have already turned into rags. They are no good. They cannot even serve as a moral remedy against frost. And we should still rejoice and thank God that everything remains the same. To lie in the steppe with a rifle in our hands now, when everything is covered with ice and snow, when tanks with a red star, those T-34s that strike fear into us, are approaching poorly equipped field positions? No, it is even worse. Therefore, we'd better hope that everything will really stay the same. Even without fuel, without warm uniforms, we'd better burrow one more floor deeper. That's what I thought on the way back. Tomorrow, with its harsh reality, is knocking imperiously at the door. What this reality will look like, no one knows. But an ominous premonition arises in my soul, and again doubts that do not give me peace. As if in a delirium, I hear the words. This can't go on, Feidler said them weeks ago. But the general answered into the telephone receiver. The situation will soon improve. Not far from the flower pot, I met a cross-country car. There's an officer next to the driver. This is Oberlunutent Mark Graf from the 24th Panzer Division. On my call, he only waves his hand and shouts. There's no time. I'm on my way to an important reconnaissance. I still manage to persuade him to come for a moment to my dugout which is located quite close. There are a lot of people in the front room. Officers, Hartfell Feeble, and a few non-commissioned officers in a semicircle around the adjutant. They attack him with all sorts of questions. The wildest rumors are reported. If even half of them were true, our last hour would have already come. I bring some comfort by telling you about the information I've just received at division headquarters. Some believe and calm down. Others see me off with incredulous glances as I walk with the Margrave into the next room. Yes, what I have to hear now is the least suitable to put me in a triumphant mood. Perhaps a funeral march would be more appropriate. The troops intended to liquidate the breakthrough, about whom the chief of the operational department of the division headquarters spoke, are not fresh forces at all. They came from the rear. They were taken here at our place, near Stalingrad, where the front is already so thin that it is about to tear. The 24th Panzer Division is gathering today all available motorized units. 
everything that is on wheels and can roll at all, to stop the enemy's advance from the direction of Kletskaya tomorrow. Only the hastened motorized infantry and the bulk of the division's artillery are left at the positions, and the rest. The 24th Tank Regiment, the 40th Anti-Tank Division, Anti-Aircraft Division and Artillery Division is intended to participate in the counterattack. The situation is similar in other divisions. The Margrave himself was ordered with his Atige guns tomorrow to arrive in Kalaksh to the bridge over the Don. There will be the CP of his division commander. Everything else is still unclear. A, I am, so to speak, the advanced reconnaissance detachment of our forces sent to discover the best way to Kalak, says Mark Roth. But the snow has completely changed the situation. Yes, the Russians chose the right moment for the attack. On the one hand, the snow helps them, and on the other hand, we are now so exsanguinated that we can allocate only a small force to contain them. Hmm, just don't be frightened, and we'll manage somehow. If the Russians do manage to get through further, well, let them. If they get away from their troops and supply bases, we'll hit them there. Hey, that's great optimism. But you'd better not miscalculate. Think of last winter and think of the current battles in the city. They've taught us a thing or two. Ah, whatever. I'll take thirty guns with me. This is Paul Markgraf, the man about whom his soldiers say he wants to take Stalingrad alone. We haven't known each other very long, but his frank manner, which disposes to trust, quickly brought us closer together, so I can tell him my concerns. He too sees things in a less than rosy light, but ultimately believes in the offensive spirit of his soldiers while underestimating the harsh enemy. I tell him that the day after tomorrow I will also be in Kalash and perhaps I will drop in on him. He jumps up. It's time to go. In the air ringing with frost under the low-hanging winter sky, his car rushes westward. Anxiety and nervousness pervade the army. All conversations and telephone conversations revolve around the same topic. The Russian offensive. In the dugouts dizzy from rumours, eyewitness accounts and all sorts of reports. As rheumatic old women by the pain in their bones in advance foreboding the approach of a thunderstorm. So pulls and breaks and the wounded body of the army. November 20 begins with a new snowfall. The clouds hang quite low, almost touching the earth with their grey clods, and the white blanket enveloping it rises even higher. The wind is sweeping mountains of snow. The drifts are already up to the windows, skidding the doors. The snow threatens to cut us off, to wall us up in shelters. The enemy is striving for the same thing. Already in the early morning, reports are coming in that make us fear the worst. The locally limited failure in the northeast is taking on wider and wider proportions. And south of Stalingrad at Lake Tutsa, a new breakthrough. The spearheads of the Russian offensive deep into our rear. The remnants of the defeated system of defensive fortifications hanging in the air. Tactical communication with neighbors broken. No reserves. The troops are waiting for instructions and help. They cannot help themselves. They are too weak. Meanwhile, Russian columns are rushing forward, breaking through gaps. Take prisoners, take trophies and move on. How far, where? The blow in the direction of Kletskaya is clearly aimed at Kalak. In the south, the front of the 20th Romanian Division has been broken through. The 297th Division has withdrawn its flank. Now the way for tanks is open here as well. If they will move in the same direction, it means that this operation has as its goal Kalak. Today and away from us are finally leaving a larger force. Their task is to prevent the realization of these plans of the Russians. In addition, somewhere behind must be and reserve divisions. After all, the army group headquarters, it's not a circle of wise men. In that Eddie took the necessary measures in advance. In the drawer of some desk is probably already lying pre-prepared response to this Russian strike and the necessary troops are on the way. However, if the Russians manage to break through to Kalach from the north and south, we will be surrounded, it would be, so to speak, a real cauldron. The Russians have never organized such a thing for us during the whole war, but no matter how hard it is, we can't turn a blind eye to it. The defense lines are broken and Kalak is no longer protected. It looks like the enemy will still be able to carry out his plan. We've had enough surprises here already. Why don't the Russians successfully strike this one? Let us not make the mistake of thinking that the Russians know nothing of the Battle of Cannes. We are in too stupid a position. We are fighting for the Volga here in front, and from the rear hundreds of kilometers behind us our fatal fate is already approaching us. 
One thing is clear, the initiative is in the hands of the enemy. We are passive. He imposes his actions on us. Who could have predicted this a couple weeks ago? Unthinkable. And yet it's true. By noon, the sky is clearing. Motorized units, tanks, heavy weapons are moving past the flower pot under the bright sunlight. They must slow down the Russian advance to Rututu Jivayat enemy fighting orders. Urja, all morning restlessly walking back and forth in the dugout, now sits at the table and whistles. I'm not up to it. No, I don't like the whole story. Franz turned 27 today. Feidler and the doctor come in. Now there are five of us together with Berger. When we sit down at the unplanked table, it becomes almost cosy in the warm dugout. Yellow light illuminates the walls, reflects off the ceiling and falls on our faces. The doctor's bald head just shines under such light. Soon there is an impenetrable tobacco smoke in the den. Franz sips an English pipe, the others prefer cigarettes. Feidler is the only non-smoker. That's why he looks fresh, to the envy of everyone. He tells all sorts of incredible episodes from his life before the war. It is quite in his style. Otherwise he could... In his upper Silesian dialect he gives out unthinkable cases from his own medical practice. From time to time, to the cheers of approval, they bring us grog. In this icy winter, it is the best way to lift our spirits. The uniforms are unbuttoned. Feidler is hot. He takes off his uniform, puts it on my bunk, and in his undershirt sits down beside us. Berger is unusually quiet today. His intelligent eyes stare a little tiredly through his dark-rimmed glasses. But he keeps up with the others. He will insert a couple of lines or tell a few piquant anecdotes or remember something from French literature. He is of somewhat weak constitution. He endures winter and unforeseen events hard, but he remains steadfast. He has a gift for listening to others, even tonight when Franz, our newborn, is just bursting with narcissism. Franz jumps from one topic to another, from Troy to the last regatta, from Hoon Graves to Black Cats like a hurricane through different times and countries. You can listen to him relentlessly. He is in good spirits and talks about his youthful pranks. However, he is not far from them. He did one of those things the other day. Yeah, you can't take a guy like that with your bare hands. And a creature with black glittering eyes looks at us in surprise. He's not used to it. So Hannibal wiggles his ears. Hannibal is a dog, something between a suckling lion cub and a skein of wool, my faithful companion for a year now. And not just in the tent and dugout. On close trips, he lies on the fender of the car or in the back and looks around with his intelligent eyes, occasionally shaking his head and expressing his feelings in his doggy way. Now he grumbles unhappily, but immediately calms down as soon as Franz takes him on his lap. Like a well-mannered thoroughbred dog, he gives a paw and stretches out on the floor to his full height. However, Hannibal can quite fit in the pocket of his overcoat. Mm. Come here, little boy, lie down and be good. Ah, at least something soft to hold on my birthday, he says Franz. Hannibal accepts the Jaska, showing complete understanding. To think of it, what a shame. Not even two months after he got married. And here you sit here and let your wife lie in bed and freeze alone. You were the ones who wanted to come here. Do you remember when I told you not to come? With these words I give a theme to all the others. They pounce on the young husband, agitate him with their words, he thinks. In other environments, we try to outdo each other in jokes. We have fun like children, and the one on whom our fire is focused is only to fight back. But today the mood is different. The Soviet operation casts its shadow over everything. Someone mentions it, and Franz immediately turns the conversation to a new topic. It's not a problem for me, Yui, he declares. Both breakthroughs can be quickly eliminated. Our commanders are not newcomers. Behind, too, everything will come into motion will be tossed division by division, plus new weapons. I'd like to know who can resist them. No one's going to fight back, and neither will the Russians. Amen, says Feidler. Well said. Send it to the frontline newspaper. They'll be happy to print your words there. Franz, my dear, are you awake or what? Do you think we'd be sitting here if we had more troops? And now they're going to fall out of the sky. You don't believe it yourself. You don't believe in new weapons. And the Russians aren't fighting today like they did last year, I say. What have we achieved this summer? Did we absorb kilometers? Yes. But did we take as many prisoners as in the 41st? Where are the old trophies? Not even close. The enemy is fighting a holding battle, and if he retreats, it's by all rules. 
and suddenly iron resistance in this goddamn corner. You think it's all a load of crap? This operation is well thought out and it's going according to plan. If we don't get help, we're in danger of being left here all alone. Then we won't have time for Hore and March. March forward. It'll be time to give the command. Prayer helmets off. Believe me. Berger can't take it. Mr. Captain sees everything in too gloomy a light. After all, up until now it was us who dictated the course of the war. Why should things change now? Whatever you say, I know. Our command wants to trap the Russians. Everything is going according to plan. Eh, how did you come up with such a crazy idea? Because this year we've had too few prisoners and equipment in our hands. So the OK sat down and came up with this plan. Open the front line, the enemy's equipment and troops will rush into the hole, and the more the better, and then the front will slam behind us. Take the whole army. Look, Berger, you're out of your mind. It's nothing like that. Remember how we clung to every meter at Serafimovich? Those were the first Russian attempts to establish a bridgehead. How we were suffocating from weakness, from lack of reserves. Do you really think that the balance of forces has changed so much in our favor that we can afford to play cat and mouse? That's exactly what I think. We in our corner didn't have enough power then, that's true. But how do we know it was like that everywhere else? In the meantime, a new contingent of younger men were taken into the army, those with reservations were sent to the front. Well, I'll explain it to you in a moment. I talked to a lot of soldiers during my vacation. It's like our situation everywhere. This year was simply a command and staff exercise. Look at the Caucasus. Do you know how many men were supporting the northern flank? A single company of scooter riders which covered a hundred kilometers. They laid a couple of mines here and there and did patrol and reconnaissance in small groups. That's what it looks like. And you're talking about large forces. It's a miracle things have gone more or less well so far. But someday there has to be a collapse. The others aren't stupid. We're the only ones who believe that we were doing the big thing with Rommel. Etc, 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 etc. It's all talk. Even if we reach the Volga, we'd still never see West Asia. A utopian goal, a fiction of those who make the mood. We should have realized that the Russians would not let us go one step further. Still... I will not give up my opinion. One must see the other side. Gradually the reserves are running out. Maybe this is the last attempt of the Russians. They know it well and have scraped together what they have in the rear. We must end the war at some point. How else can we achieve this, unless we destroy the enemy's equipment and manpower, and so that the Russians will get the spirit out of us? Then they'll calm down. And if we finish with the Russians, the English alone will not be able to fight. That will be the end of the matter. I think the war will last another two, maybe three months. No, it won't last that long. The play will be over by Christmas. We'll return to Berlin on horseback, through the Brandenburg Gate, and the girls will run after us. That'll be a feast, exclaims Franz. Do both of them really think so? How can we understand it? And is there any point in arguing with them today? Maybe we've all had too much to drink. But then Feidler enters the conversation. Give him some cold water. Let's talk sense. The Russians have broken through behind us. They're advancing every day. Our troops still haven't arrived. And at a time like this, you declare with complete conviction that we'll be out of the war by Christmas. Well, you can't take that seriously. The war will last so long that the five of us won't live to see the end of it. We're all exhausted to the limit. We'll be killed the day after tomorrow. That's my opinion. That's why I don't bother thinking about peace. If it goes the other way, so much the better. Well, a pleasant surprise. After this speech, Feidler is fortified with Grog. He hasn't said so much at one time in months. And I, too, think we'll never see the end of the war, I say. But not because we all be killed before then, but because we have. We don't have the strength to knock out the Russians. And neither, of course, do they. So here in the East, it's going to be a protracted positional war. I imagine that somewhere we'll build a strong eastern rampart and withdraw behind it. Let the others break their teeth then. Let every German serve in the east for two years. It will be a harsh education for our youth. Don't you want to sit here in winter positions if you have to? No, we've had enough. We deserve a little rest. Maybe the doctor will stay here voluntarily. I wouldn't think of it. It's been a long time since I've been home. My patients are probably already being treated by other doctors, some asthmatic. 
who's been studying for three or four years and has managed to evade military service, will take away all my practice and treat my patients to death. I had already gotten used to the idea that I would have to start all over again, but I'll never be lured out of my home again, not even by a golden mountain. Franz is still not happy. He's waiting for the doctor to finish speaking. One thing you have forgotten, he exclaims, the Führer. How cleverly he has been able to achieve his goals so far. And always at the right moment. I am firmly convinced that he will succeed here in the East. The Russians will one day falter. Think of the England-Russia controversy. There's a lot of money to be made in that. These words pour water on Berger's mill. He excitedly adjusts his horn-rimmed glasses. You completely discount the personality of the Führer. Everything is inextricably linked to him. Think of this and of universal conscription, Austria, Czechoslovakia, the Berlin-Rome axis, the Three Power Pact, the elimination of unemployment. Isn't that enough? And then the war. We march triumphantly across Europe, and now we keep our heads down. The whole world envies us for having such a man. As long as he's at the head of the right, we have nothing to fear. Of course, he makes mistakes sometimes. I can't argue with that. He's not God. But on the whole, things have always gone forward. Berger, says Feidler, you cannot learn that here you are not the editor of the newspaper. For years you have been repeating these eulogies in the newspaper and then you yourself believed in them. You have seen for yourselves in great detail what nonsense it all is. Giant targets and a pathetic bunch of soldiers, not enough at the front or in the rear. The man's gone rogue. What do we need initial successes if we can't hold on to what we've captured? And then comes the big question. Was it right to start the war in the first place? Now Berger and Franz are taking on Feidler together. How is it right at all? It's too much for them. It's a rebellion. And this is coming from a comrade, a good comrade. It can't be. It can't be. Paul's getting his ass kicked. But he's calm. Accusations, attacks, words about living space bounce off him like peas off a wall. Don't be so quick to judge. I don't want to argue with you. I'm just sharing my own thoughts. And if I can't express them in this circle, then say so. I thought the same thing as you when it all started in 39. But since then I've had to swallow a lot of things that don't give me peace. For instance, the winter stuff, it hasn't arrived yet, and it's probably being carried by intendants somewhere in Kiev or Krakow. Minor inconsistencies, you might say. Well, what if such inconsistencies are repeated from year to year? Every year in the fall they announce to us, the Russians are defeated, and in the winter they kick us in the arse. Is that called good command, Franz? And how was unemployment? Let's not talk about that. What do you think of Gopner's demotion? What do you think of the SS atrocities? These are all things that can't be overlooked. Ask our commander. His eyes have not only opened during his vacation, they've also opened up. I have to take a stand. Paul is looking for support. I must come to his aid. I tell him what Rominger told me. Franz and Berger have to shut up when they hear about what's going on upstairs. They are unable to imagine it. And you know, I heard such criticism of the leadership not only in Vinitsa. On the way home and at home, I had to hear a lot of negative statements. You just have to be able to listen. Now, the trust is not the same as it was three years ago. We will still leave with a black eye. We made a mess, now we have to clean it up. For me as a commander, it's interesting to hear how my officers' opinions differ. The young are the obvious optimists for whom such concepts as law, morality and freedom are almost non-existent. The upbringing received in the Hitler youth has clearly undermined their ability to think for themselves. They were encouraged by high-sounding words, and now they fight fiercely without realizing what is actually written on their banner. The intoxication with phrases has become a method of education and has turned into a normal spiritual state of a whole generation, and slogans pursuing a very definite goal have become the content of their lives. I myself am 31 years old. But here, on the front line, I belong, together with the doctor and Paul Feidler, to the older offices. We have a more sober view of things. We are no longer schoolboys. When we go out to go to Kalach, it is already light. It is frosty. Next to me are Franz, Imig and Statter. The frost stings my cheeks. It's good that we wrapped up tightly in the open car can freeze. After a short rest in the nursery, we drive on. The weather is the same as yesterday. The morning fog cleared, the sun came out. However, the frost has not given up. No one is awake, but everyone is silent. Words freeze on the lips. 
but we smoke incessantly, clutching cigarettes in clumsy fur mittens. Franz smokes his Sopli Greca, as Fiddler called yesterday, the English pipe of which the lieutenant is so proud. Mild confusion reigns in Kalach. Fear of the Russians pervades the troops. I am glad that I met an officer from the headquarters of the 24th Panzer Division. From him I learned that the Margrave is in Sukhanov. We find this settlement on the map. So that's where it is. Ham, only 30 kilometers from here, no more. What are they doing there? Have the Russians made it this far? No one can answer that question, and we can't rely on assumptions. We have to find out for ourselves. First I go to the Army Sapper School to pick up two of my non-commissioned officers who are taking a short course there. No luck. It's already empty. The old staff felt bail. Apparently the barracks chief reports that all personnel departed as early as yesterday to take up a defensive position a few kilometers to the west. Exactly the name of the settlement he cannot name, but we can't wait for the soldiers to return, and we immediately set off in the direction of Sukhanov. We haven't even traveled half an hour as a bleak picture appears before us. A crowd of soldiers, 30 to 40 people, is moving towards us. They crawl like snails, stop every two, three, 20 meters, stand, then someone takes a stick, and the platoon again drags a few meters forward. Everyone is dressed in summer uniforms. No one is wearing fur or woolen clothes. Warm headphones are the only thing that corresponds to the time of year. Faces are red, some are already dead gray and yellowed. It all seems monstrous to me. I stop the soldiers and call the nearest one to me. What unit? The soldier stares at me with feverishly glittering eyes. Despite the cold sweat is rolling off him, Mr. Captain, we are all seriously ill. We all have a temperature of 39 to 40. We've been walking since yesterday morning. Where from? Um, I don't know the name of the village. It's about 50 kilometers from here. He's pointing northeast. Mm. What are you doing here? We were just thrown out of the infirmary because the Russians were advancing. The doctors and orderlies ran away. One even told us, if you don't want to be shot, get out quickly to Kalich. So we're going. Do you have a doctor with you? None. Where they went, we don't know. They left everything as it was and ran away. Don't worry, they'll be punished. The most important thing for you is to get to another hospital. It's still ten kilometers to Kalok. Will you hold out? Hey, I don't know, Mr. Captain. Last night one of them was left lying in the snow. He fell on the road and never got up again. We hope the others will make it. They should have a good trip. Meanwhile, eight more critically ill people came and surrounded our car. I give them a pack of cigarettes. There's nothing else to help. Let's keep going. The Russians are 50 kilometers away, as the soldier said. But who knows, maybe it's just a rumor, and the doctors have already lost their heads from fear. What irresponsibility. To throw out on the road patients with high fever and send them to certain death. Wait, I'll give these gentlemen a hard time. I'll report to the command tonight. I've made up my mind. The icy wind blows across the steppe, scorches the face, raises whole clouds of freshly fallen snow, sweeps away the well-travelled track. The car is struggling to get forward. To the right and left stretches a dull plain covered with snow. In some places, dried steppe grass breaks through the layer of snow. Steep slopes and deep gullies complicate the way. Tony has to drive semi-standing for long periods of time with one hand in front of his eyes and the other on the steering wheel to avoid all the potholes. The speed is appropriate, but you can't go any faster without the road, without signposts and landmarks. What's that? Gunshots? Or just engine noise? More. Artillery fire, no doubt about it. From which direction? And how far from here? Opinions differ. The strong wind makes it hard to tell. It muffles the sounds, speeds them up, carries them. How can we orient ourselves? Anyway, it's still far away. We're calming down. There's no one here in this neighborhood yet. There's a wild pack coming at us from the left, and it's approaching us fast. That's how Carl Materbunny described wild horses galloping with their manes waving, but they are indeed horses. Some are unsaddled, others are dragging the reins behind them. We see bloody necks and bloody legs. With a pitiful roar, the horses cross the road twenty meters ahead of us. The lame ones are not lagging behind. The intestines of a white horse fall out. The horses disappear as suddenly as they appeared. They are swallowed up by a veil of snow in the east. It all looks as if a whole cavalry force was fighting somewhere. Where else would so many cavalry horses come from? That's news. 
At least in this war I've never seen cavalry squadrons with their sabres drawn. The horses will die, starve to death. They'll find no fodder. But here, on the battlefield, where the fate of countless people is, and will be decided every day, it is ridiculous to feel pity for horses, and yet this feeling creeps into us. After all, they are not at all to blame, and the wheel of war has mercilessly crushed them. There is not much time for reflection. The road, this only faintly marked line, which you find only because it is marked on the map, revives. A sleepy rider passes by, he sees and hears nothing. The horse that drives him forward is thinking he might have seemed a ghost, this Romanian, if he had not been followed by a whole caravan, a real embodiment of disaster and despair, arousing a feeling of acute compassion. Soldiers with bandaged heads and hands in bows waddled past, two with uncovered heads support a third, whose broken knee is tied with a blanket. Seeping drops of blood are frozen on the boots. These wretched figures are now wandering without purpose, with their heads bowed on their chests, no eyes to be seen. Heads with slicked hair sway from side to side with each step. The soldiers mechanically move their feet. Left, right, farther, farther, left, right they step, the living embodiment of horror. No more strength, but we must go, we must go at all costs. We are no longer human beings, we are just living beings. Everything else is cast aside. We don't need everything else. You see, we are unarmed, unbelted, in rags. We are devastated internally as well. We have abandoned everything. We can't even list what we have abandoned. Because we have also abandoned our memory. We are only saving our lives, nothing else. It is not us who are walking now. We are no longer human. It is the life still alive in us that is walking and wants to save itself at all costs, causing fear and crying out for compassion. Whoever stops us, we will smash his head. Get out of our way. In our situation we are ready for anything. We don't think. We can't think. We only want one thing. To live right further away. Don't stare at us. Go your own way. We don't need you. Give us the way. We are a defeated army, but our own life is most precious to us. We will hide it where no one will find it. Well, have you had enough? We are no longer fit even as cannon fodder. We infect others like the plague with our desire to survive, and therefore do not ask us anything, or we are sorry that your widow will cry. We step left, right, left, right, left, right, further, further, when you have to stop. In the middle of the road a soldier with his pants down is squatting. The snow is coloured red. Matty brown eyes look at me apathetically. Okay, I'll wait. Now the first healthy soldiers appear, strong. Four in red hats. They are cackling. One of them is waving a vodka bottle. Clearly they've injected themselves with a little courage. The schnapps must be from the stockpile. When you have to retreat, you grab what you've been missing for so long. I'll have a drink, then another, and you too. Come here. Sip it. Drink as much as you like. We've got plenty of it today. No more. Give me another one. Let's try it too. Vodka's not very strong. Then throw the bottle to smithereens like this. Bring another one. That's good. Now I'm a man too. Let everything go to hell. To your health, good health. Now let's fill our pockets and hurry. The Russians are coming. And you take some too. Who knows where our journey will end. Drunken soldiers stop near us. They stink of liquor. Cigarettes. They beg. Cigarettes. Cigarettes. I give them a pack. More and more Romanians pass by us. I see eyes, pleading, apathetic, fearful, glittering with madness and hostile, full of hatred, unrestrained, disorderly. The crowd flows past me, soldiers walking in groups and singly. I am glad that the soldier on the road has already finished his work and we can go on. Towards us is a field kitchen. It is covered with wounded soldiers from top to bottom, so that the horses can hardly pull. A few more field kitchens, then three small trucks. They too unloaded to the top, unhappy, dumbfounded faces, some shadows clinging to the sides with curled fingers. They walk dully, stepping mechanically with their feet. Their tall sheepskin hats slipped down almost to their noses, their collars covering their mouths, so that only a piece of unshaven cheek was visible, hidden from the burning wind. Almost everyone, with the exception of the bellowing drunks, walks in silence. No one pays any attention to my shouting, and they probably wouldn't understand my German speech. I wanted to know where these soldiers were coming from, what had happened there. There are still no officers in sight, though one seems to be lying on a truck, now a number of mounted men are approaching. They sit backwards on their horses to keep their faces out of the wind and pull their knees up. 
Their shoulders and necks are wrapped in blankets and shawl. Many of the horses have two riders each. The rear one clings to the front one to keep from falling off. Two riders on one horse, some kind of balaganza, if all this did not speak of trouble. A frightful sight, the soldiers, two, four, six, eight, are marching towards their new goal, but they don't even know where it is. They don't look ahead. They don't care where they are going. The most important thing is further, further. They cast glances at us. They are not friendly, and the least we can expect is friendly looks from these Romanians. Why are you staring at us like that, German? You're the one responsible for our funeral procession. Look at us. Oh, you didn't know that. And who brought us here? Who threw us into battle in this damn place? Who told us to hold our positions? You say our government. Bullshit? It's you Germans. You do what you want everywhere without asking anyone. You'd better get out of my way. We're fed up with you. Look at this. See, I'm wounded in the arm and leg. Why? I'm asking you for our cause. No, for you. And those who were killed died for you too. And now you're standing here thinking, a wild mob, this will never happen to us. Wait, maybe it will happen to you too. Then you'll think of us too, and you'll want to have one horse, but not for two, but for four. Finally, I notice an officer, a lieutenant. I call him to the car. With great reluctance, he gets off the unsaddled horse and comes close to me. Greenish inflamed eyes with black lashes staring at me with fury. What do you want? Where are you coming from? What part? Hey, our business. What's the reason for this flight? It's a terrible picture. The Russians are there. The Russians are there. The Russians are there. He points west, northwest and north with his hand and wants to go on his way. Another rider on horseback is already calling him. Hey, but there must be more German troops ahead. Don't you want to fight with them? After all, it's about... We're pretty much fighting for Hitler. Hitler is kaput. Everything is kaput. I try to talk to him nicely. He laughs mockingly, taps himself on the forehead with his index finger and turns abruptly. You go to hell? I've had enough. I give the command to drive on. No need for words. The reasons for their defeat are obvious, both material and moral. But militarily, broken divisions are a burden, nothing more. Better to fight alone, with no neighbours on the right or left. Better open flanks. At least you know what you can count on. I'm glad to be out of this nightmare. But after a few kilometres we meet the group again. Once again we are passed by barely moving living shadows with their eyes open and closed. They don't care where the road takes them. They are fleeing the war. They want to save their lives. And everything else is irrelevant. The Romanian colonel speaks frankly to me, adjusting the pus-soaked bandage on his head. There, there's nothing more you can do with my soldiers. They won't obey any orders, I know them. In a week's time, perhaps they'll get over this condition. But until then, I have practically no command authority over them. That's the impression I get. Truly, the army is shuttered. These words sound quite appropriate here. For an artist who wants to paint a retreat, here is a living nature stretching for many kilometers. The tattered and disheveled columns disappear in a maze of snowy gullies. Now all attention is absorbed in moving forward. A large village appears in front of us in the snowy desert, and a small village remains on the left. Behind the village the hill rises for forty meters. Nothing is visible behind it. A movement is clearly visible at the height. I look through binoculars. It's Germans, a little more, and we are already driving between clay and wooden houses along the street of the village. On the road stands a group of military men, two of them gesticulating animatedly. Now I ask them what the name of the village is. I stop and in one of them I recognize Mark Gruff, arguing with some rear non-commissioned officer. And I tell you that you will not blow it up before we get everything we need out of here. If you had orders from anybody, I'd like to hear them. I don't give a damn. I give the orders here. The Margrave turns to the thin faces surrounding him. Let's do it. Clean the shop to the bottom, bring it to this house. Quickly, so he can complete his task. Get on with it. The crowd rushes in, and I get out of the car and approach the Margrave. He laughs. You're just in time. This guy just showed up here and shoved an order under my nose. Immediately blow up the food warehouse in Sukhanov. Hmm. So this is Sukhanovit? Listen to me. There are crates of canned meat, chocolate, cookies, cigarettes and other things we haven't gotten for months. And a huge amount of schnapps. Don't get me wrong. 
This guy wants to blow it all up without giving us a dime. I try to reason with him, but he's rude and says something about looting. Well, since talking doesn't work, I had to threaten him. Come on, or we'll freeze to death. We enter a half-dark warehouse. It has everything a soldier's heart could desire. The soldiers of the anti-tank unit are already in charge. In the sweat of their faces, they pull out boxes and roll out barrels. One of them tastes camel on the spot. We don't have to look for a long time, because everything is in plain sight. We stuff chocolate bars in our pockets and move on. A few hundred meters, and we're there. Franz stays with us, and Imig and Statter go to the house where the liaisons are. Paul tells us. As far as I'm concerned, it's a mess. Even Franz, my professional optimist, and he frowns his forehead. Even last night at about 23 hours, the anti-tank division entered Sukhanov. Here it found only the remnants of the Corp Supply Chief's wagon. No Russians have yet been seen. This morning the first alarm was raised in the neighboring village of Novo Buzinovskaya, just two kilometers from here. Appeared the first Russian tanks. On the heights that we had seen before, defensive positions were set up in terrible haste, though only for heavy weapons. The infantry still had not come up. Two Russian tank companies made an attack, but were driven back, four tanks being hit. By 9 a.m., the Russians had brought up three cavalry brigades and several tank units. The expected offensive began about 12 o'clock, but was repulsed. You can imagine we're not very comfortable here. It's going to be a hot day today. From what direction did you actually come from? Nertiut. Is that so? Did you pass through Yaroslavsko? It's a small village not far from our capital city. No, we left it on the left. That's what I wanted to know. You're damn lucky. There are Russians in it. You see, fools are always lucky. That's impossible, because the village is behind your lines. There's nothing we can do about it. We're back to maneuver warfare here. Shortly after nine o'clock, the Russians cut in southwest and broke into this very Eroslanovsko. We counted 80 tanks. From there, they'll probably strike at Kalak. Those units won't have time for us. Hmm, so how can I get out of here today? It's not so terrible yet. The road along the Don Heights is still free. Go through Peskovatka. Around 2-0 in the afternoon. Franz and I prepare to leave. Suddenly a liaison comes through. Mr. Oberlutnant, they're coming. We run out into the street. The battle has already started. The village is covered with fire from ten batteries. They're hitting rocket launchers and mortars. Everything rattles, hisses, rumbles, shrieks and howls like a giant chorus of howling devils. Houses are collapsing, iron sheets from roofs are flying in the air. Through the hail of debris I run after the Margrave. I only manage to see Tony put the car behind a brick wall and fall waste deep in snow. Into the firebag we climb as fast as possible up the steep slope. More than once we help each other to get out of meter-deep pits covered with snow. Completely wet from tension and excitement, we finally reach the bare top of the right height. A freezing wind blows through us. Now we can see the white-painted tanks approaching. They are T-34s and T-60s. They are still two kilometers away from us. From here, from above, we have a good view. We can see the tanks, white hulks. And even with the naked eye, you can count 60 of them. Crawl out of the small village, which with its huts with snow-covered roofs and plat bands, is located 500 meters behind the tanks, but you can see much farther away. The air is surprisingly clear today. On the horizon appear column after column, motorized and mounted, including tanks, and it seems to me that they are all going in the same direction, as if they are all rushing here to flatten us to the ground. The front tanks are still a kilometer and a half away from us. The infantry is on them. You can clearly distinguish it, despite the white camouflage jackets. To the right comes the hastened cavalry. The horses stand on the outskirts of the village. The Margrave watches calmly for now, giving orders and distributing the first targets. The soldiers at the anti-tank and anti-aircraft guns are lying down in their snow-covered cells, which they hastily dug to hide from the iron hail. And he is what it is. Continuously the shells burst, forming black holes in the white carpet. Like trumpets of a huge shamanka. Parallel to each other, traces of Katyusha Salvo were drawn in the sky, playing the rumble of explosions. Another volley. But the damage is still not great. Our guns are intact. As far as I can see the position, none of Mark Graf's soldiers have been killed yet. He himself is lying next to us. Now the tanks with the red stars are firing. All their guns are hitting with short, dry shots, 
which burst with the same dry sound near us. The Margrave quickly explains to me that some tanks cannot attack although they stood in the village behind us, but still in the morning shot all their ammunition. He looks through the binoculars. Then he says only one word. Suddenly, a flare shoots up into the sky, and now our guns are talking. Salvo after salvo. Gunners and loaders are working with full tension. Bronze cast their faces in the cold winter wind. The Russian advance is slowing down. Infantry jumped off the tanks and lay in the deep snow. The tanks are frozen in place. The first one is burning. Behind him, another pillar of smoke rises in height and stretches to the side. Our artillerymen charge and shoot, charge and shoot, do not have time to bring shells. The first success is not forced to wait. The offensive front is broken. The first confusion is introduced. The Russians have suspended their attack. They seem to be contemplating how to proceed. The first tanks have turned back. The attack is repulsed. The position is held. The hasty cavalry retreats back into the village on the right, pursued by bursting shells. But no one thinks that this private success will remain only an episode, that the enemy wants to avoid unnecessary losses and simply bypass Sukhanovo. Half an hour later, we are driving in the direction of the Don Heights. My hand watch shows four. The wind has died down a little, we remember the fighting mood of Mark Graf's division, and we feel a little better than we did in the morning when we met the retreating troops, everyone except Tony. He's swearing as hard as he can. In this light, driving on a completely unfamiliar snowy road is little fun. But it can't be helped. We have to go back. The darkness can't frighten us. Now it's uncomfortable to drive a single car in any situation. The snow glistens under the moon with a cold gloss, casting a bluish-gray glow. Far behind us, we hear the sounds of heavy artillery fire. The battle is still raging there. After all I have seen today, its outcome is quite clear to me. Weak cut-off positions have been broken through or bypassed by the Russians. Part of their forces are already here. Kalak will fall too, too. It can't be avoided. But what then? Our command will have to crack a hard nut. A strong push. What happened? Tony. The log's been run over, Mr. Captain. A few hundred meters later, another bump. Another log. How come there are so many logs lying on the road here in the forestless steppe? I stop the car, go back a few steps. There it is. Log. Not a log, but a man we ran over. A completely stiffened corpse without an overcoat, without a hat, without boots is lying across the road. It's a Romanian soldier probably collapsed from exhaustion. There was no room for him in any car. He was not put on any horse, just abandoned. The others think only of themselves. For God's sake, don't stop. Further, further. Who else is destined to sacrifice himself, yet everyone help themselves as best they can? Who will take care of me? Let him lie there. He's wearing good boots. He doesn't need them anymore, and he won't need his overcoat either. And now on the road further, further, but don't stop. The Russians are coming from behind. We have to remove five more half-naked corpses from the road to continue the way. But now we are approaching the Rososhka River. We are met and followed by a wild noise. The Romanians shower us with curses and swearing in their own language as we approach them. In the lowland by the river, there is a tangle of people, horses and wagons. The slopes are covered with ice. It is easy to descend, but it is difficult to climb the opposite bank. We have to push horses and cars. Since between them, the wounded fall down. The wheels go right over them. No one cares. No one listens to the death cries and groans. Horses are rushing over the fallen. The living are striding. Everyone is striding forward. Who has fallen? There is no help for him. We can't support him. One, two, we've got him. We've got him again. Where are we coming from? From there. We can't hold off the Russians. We wanted to get to Kalek, but they blocked our way, so we had to retreat. No time to talk. We're in a hurry. Get down. We'll soon get to the other side. But the field kitchen is down there. We'll leave the horses with only bones left and the trampled men here. Tomorrow everything will freeze and they'll be covered with snow. We'd be long gone, but half of our men left at once and they didn't even think of us. They've gone far away. But we'll move now too. We're not grieve. The field kitchen is with us. We don't care about the others. Our shirt is closer to our body. Now I'm in a hurry. Just to get out of here. I don't want to see any more of these people. I'm filled with rage. But compassion too. This is what escape looks like. Today the Romanians are fleeing. And tomorrow...
Do we have any guarantee that the same thing won't happen to us? The Russian divisions that have broken through are rolling towards us. They will hit the rear of the army, where there are headquarters and wagons, where there are bakers and letter carriers, but where there are no reserves. What then? The way ahead has cleared. Tony accelerates the car with a fierce fury. The eight-cylinder Ford with chain-linked wheels pulls well, and we make it up the hill without stopping and whiz past the retreating Romanians. A few kilometers later, we pass a field airfield. We are met by an ominous fire. The flames blaze up to the sky, yellow, red, blue, gasoline is burning. Airplanes are burning. Yes, airplanes, transport scouts, dive bombers, the few that until this morning were still serving us. They're deliberately destroying equipment. The Russians are coming, nothing must fall into their hands. The engines won't start. Tried it, it doesn't work. There's nothing else to do. No matter how hard it is, burn the cars. Burn the gasoline. What else? Blow up the spare parts depots. Hurry, hurry, we must destroy everything. The Russians are coming, the Russians... Panic fear has gripped everyone here in the army rear while the battle is going on up ahead. The madmen, those who until now had been sitting in the rear drinking schnapps in the casino, clicking their heels and only knew how to respond to the greetings of their subordinates. And now they heard the artillery cannonade and lost their nerve. What, twenty airplanes? I have to do my duty. What, you're saying we could have waited? What do you know about it? You better mind your own business? You want to know my last name? I wouldn't dream of giving it to you. This fire doesn't just destroy a few airplanes. It's sobering us up. If so many German officers lost their heads and gave in to panic, I shouldn't be surprised at the behavior of the Romanian soldiers. It's burning here too, and over there, further away too. The farther back we go, the more frequent the fire. Right in the middle of the village street, in front of the peasants' huts, on the heights, in the open field, documents, orders, secret papers, characterizations and submissions for orders, charters and maps are burning. Scribes fan the fire. Officers by the sheets throw the papers into the fire with solemn seriousness and put a check mark against the ordinal number in the list. They too are doing their duty. You bet, because their job is to write and send out orders. So why not burn it once and for once? Except we never thought about it until now. In the past, no secret order could disappear. Otherwise, arrest, court, martial, demotion, and today, throw him in the fire. The Russians are coming. Orders didn't help us before. They won't help us now. Throw them in the fire. This one, too. Don't forget to burn everything. That's the service. I answer for it with my head. November 23, 1942. Razguliefka. Noon. All commanders lined up in the dugout of the general. The first officer of the division headquarters pronounces. Gentlemen, it is accomplished. Kalach has fallen. We're surrounded. So we're in trouble. And we're in deep trouble. Completely cut off, left to our own fate, deprived of any supply of ammunition, equipment, food, have no way to transport the wounded. Our future is bleak. Such a situation is called a cauldron. The first cauldron in history was organized by Hannibal Cans. He squeezed there in the pincers of 80,000 Roman soldiers under the command of Consul Aemilius Paulus. 50,000 of them remained lying on the battlefield. 20,000 were captured. The remaining 10,000 managed to escape from the encirclement. Since then, the idea of a battle of annihilation on a possibly similar scale has kept generals and anyone who wants to be one. In the time of the Punic Wars, everything was accomplished in one day, from the offensive to the bitter end of the defeated. And on the same evening the victors shared the laurels and triumphed. But in our era, the era of colossal scale development of technology, the action of mass armies, the case looks different. I am reminded of the encirclement in France in 1940. Tens and tens of thousands of French soldiers remained in the cauldron. They could not help themselves. Here and there attempts to break through. But the French command was unable to create new fronts, organize defense, and stop the advancing enemy. Everything was already tightening the ring. Food dropped from airplanes fell into our hands, and the encircled starved, rushing between the walls of the cauldron, not obeying any order. After a number of days of increasing pressure, they had to capitulate. Weary, hungry, and ragged prisoners stretched along the roads, eyes downcast and without hope. And now we ourselves have suffered the same fate. Several hundred thousand people trapped in an iron ring. They must be fed. Well, we still have food stores, but how long will it last? Cars are breaking down, spare parts are needed. Where will the equipment come from? Where will the fuel come from? 
Overzealous people burned it as soon as there was a breakthrough on the Don. They should be put behind bars so they can't do any more harm. Headlessness is the worst thing right now. Orders are given. A few minutes later, they're cancelled. Then a new order comes, but it's impossible to carry out. Others maintain a profound silence, though they are not Moltke, who could afford it. What is needed are unambiguous, clear and precise orders. But that requires visionary commanders. They are in short supply. There is a shortage of literally everything and everywhere. Where are the troops for our new westward-facing front that must now be created? For many weeks now, the Sixth Army has been crying out for reinforcements because we are not strong enough even for our Volga front. Where are the positions behind there for the regiments that are supposed to cover us from the rear? Somewhere in the middle of a vast field of snow where the icy north wind howls? It's not that simple. The new line of defence must have been drawn on the green cloth of a desk. Some of us remember last winter. We suffered enough from such methods. Why should things suddenly be different now? Next to fight, you must have a weapon. Good, reliable weapons. They fail every day as a result of barrel wear, equipment failure or losses from enemy fire. And where do you get replacements from? By air? I have yet to see a single 88mm cannon or assault gun delivered by air. The question of airlifting ammunition is easy as long as it's infantry weapons. You can if you need to. But 150mm shells and mines are more complicated. You can't put them into a junkers in hull wagons. Everywhere you look, there are only difficulties. The troops in such a cauldron are doomed to perish if they do not get help from outside. That's exactly what it is. We need help, and we need it as soon as possible. We cannot delay a moment. Everything at hand must be mobilized immediately, put in echelons, loaded into planes and transported here, even if we have to send the entire reserve army. If they want to save us, they must break the encirclement from the outside. But the railroads... Back in the fall, there were always traffic jams and congestion, and now it's winter. It's all just chimeras. It is my mind beginning to race. Fear? I thought I was free of that feeling. But anything out of the ordinary is frightening. After all, it's not every day you get caught in a mousetrap. It would take too long to get the necessary troops by rail. We can't wait that long. There won't be much left of us to starve to death or die of epidemics. There's enough disease to last us a lifetime. Rush, dysentery, typhoid fever. We can't count on outside forces to replace us. There's no such thing or we'd have been replaced long ago. We have to hold our own. That's clear. To me anyway, Franz, that incorrigible optimist is still hoping for a miracle that will suddenly come from the West. But I don't take him seriously. He's not a bad guy, but he's dumb as a cork. I like Feidler much better. He thinks like me. We can't wait for outside help. We have to act on our own. Turn the front and get out of this hole. Get out completely. Break through to the West. The best way is in the direction of Rostov. But it should be done tomorrow, or at least the day after tomorrow. While we still have fuel and hunger has not started, otherwise it will be too late. The best thing is to go myself to the army headquarters. There I'll know exactly what's planned. The traffic on the roads is unusually heavy. Automobiles are speeding by at top speed. One liaison motorcyclist after another. They don't slow down even on the bends. Let everyone know that they can't wait. The flames can be seen far around. Fires, big and small, are blazing in the immediate vicinity and behind and far away, where the nursery burning and in the area of Gorodish. Clouds of smoke are far visible in the boundless steppe. The multitude of these fires reminds one of the bonfires in the fall fields after the potato harvest, or makes one think that the hostilities are over. Even yesterday, everyone was wary of giving away the location of their dugout by careless smoke, fearing that five minutes later there would be a fire raid. At the Tata rampart I stumbled upon the first hearth of the fire. The intendant, crossing his arms on his chest, stands calmly in front of the burning diesel truck on the car uniforms, pants, overcoats, as well as fur coats and all kinds of winter uniforms, just what we've been waiting for for weeks. Here it is consigned to the fire, and the intendant himself stands looking on like Napoleon at the fire of Moscow. To my naturally excited question, what is going on here, I get a cautionary answer. Orders from the division commander, Mr. Captain. We are breaking through. Everything unnecessary is ordered to be burned. Interesting. They're getting ready to move in and we don't even know anything about the plan. Anything unnecessary, that's what he said. But I can't think of winter uniforms and automobiles as superfluous. However, all this does not concern me. 
I have no right to interfere, much less forbid it. If they do the same where the fire is raging, it means that they are causing damage amounting to many millions of marks. But that's not the worst of it. With our fuel shortage, how will we make up for this damage? And how little fuel there is in Germany, I saw only during my last vacation. So in front of me, a fire is devouring a mountain of uniforms. And right next to me, a bunch of soldiers are sweating and pushing trucks down a ravine. Here comes the first one. 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 So thank God, one less truck, followed by the other five. The engineer standing next to him has a face like a man burying his wife. By the highest order, he makes himself unemployed. But an order is an order. It's not discussed. It's obeyed. There is a saying in the Wehrmacht. The size of my salary does not allow me to have my own opinion. It's a joke, but it's more than a joke. What I saw near Gumrak deeply hurt me. The battery has drawn up its four guns in a tight circle, barrels outward. A few seconds and they're gone. The explosion swallowed them up. Here lies the wheel from the front. Here is the castle. But the army has four guns less, said Tony says. They've all gone mad, started killing themselves. We waited for all this stuff until the last moment and they're doing this pig shit. I'd like to know what it's all for and how much it costs. Tomorrow they'll feel sorry for themselves, I bet, if only they knew back home. The lust for destruction is raging. That's what it looks like in an army that's been winning so far. The news of the encirclement has knocked it out of the saddle. Destroy everything we need. Burn file folders. All records destroy supplies of uniforms and food, equipment, fuel, barrels of gasoline, weapons. Ammunition explodes into the air. Everything is burning, hissing, rumbling, detonating, rattling, so that it seems to be the work of insane people. And they still look at what is happening with satisfaction. They have done what they were ordered to do. Well, tomorrow we'll see. We are surrounded, everyone knows it. Now we must break through, so get rid of all unnecessary things and form a marching column. Some will die. All right, we can't avoid it. But then we'll break out, break out of this Stalingrad. Damn it thrice. Isn't that a reason to rejoice? Anyone who lived through that coven on the Volga will understand that. Even someone who was here for one single day? The army command, after its flight from Golubinka and Golubinsky, had encamped in the ravine between Gumrak and Pitomnik. The equipment of the command post is not yet finished. The apparatus of the headquarters is too large. True, a lot of things and whole piles of documents had to be thrown on the Don, because there was not enough time to collect. But the remaining staff property is still quite a lot. Army headquarters is not a company office. It is full of senior and senior officers, general staff, heads of departments and divisions, and all sorts of specialists. And everyone needs his own dugout. Everyone needs a place for himself and his clerks. It is necessary to lay communication lines to provide everyone with telephones. All this takes time. So it doesn't strike me at all that I find unimaginable confusion in the army headquarters, having raised the collars of overcoats. Officers are walking back and forth in the snow, talking animatedly among themselves and gesticulating, while boxes and furniture are being dragged into hastily dugout dugouts, and already the first typewriters are clanging. In the new dugout, the headquarters life is again flowing briskly. Through the aged doors and window holes come voices you can catch scraps of words, separate unrelated phrases. And etiately. Hmm. Put the chair in that corner. The Dane connect me to the Eighth Corps. I want a motorcycle liaison sent over right away. Strike out the word may and put must. Where's the order from the Chief of Armaments of the OK? Is the Chief in his office? Write faster, Kraus. Give me a light. I need a report on the shortage immediately. Now do you twelve copies, OK? This is crazy. Who's giving the order? The confusion is intensified by the fact that every minute cars are rolling up and the arrivals begin to look for the necessary officers of the headquarters. There's a tremendous sense of nervousness in everything. Now, gentlemen, you need nerves of iron. After all, everything depends on you, our fate. Think of the whole army entrusted to you. With your help, it can still do something, if only you want it to. A whole army and more, gentlemen. I'm finding out where the Army Chief of Engineers is stationed, somewhere off to the side. In a newly equipped dugout, I am greeted by Oberlunutant Fricky, his adjutant, 
a young officer with a fresh face, straw yellow hair and friendly eyes looking from under light horn-rimmed glasses. I've known him since the summer, no sign of Colonel Zell. Mr. Captain is out of luck today. My boss is not here. He's somewhere on the other side of the cauldron. That's all I need. He's the one I wanted to find out what's going on. But Frick is damn well informed. First thing I know. The 11th Army Corps is coming out of the Dion Bend to the east. General Hube, with his 14th Tank Corps, is to hold off the enemy onslaught until the last units cross the Don. So far, everything was going according to plan. Let's hope that at the last moment at the crossing of the Dion we will not have to watch again the same spectacle that recently at Kalach, says Fricky. At Kalach, what happened there? Hey, a wild story. First the commandant of the town was in command, then the highest officer of the field gendarmerie was sent there, and then a colonel from the army headquarters was assigned to hold the town. But three bears in one den could not get along. None of them wanted to yield to the other. Meanwhile, the first T-34s had already reached the western bank of the Don and approached the bridge. The tank crews got out of their vehicles, talked to the locals on the other side of the Don and departed. Not a single shot was fired at them. The three commanders still could not agree on who was in charge. The commanders of the units had to act at their own risk. But no one took care of the bridge. There stood bravely a few sentries who only watched what was happening. They did not have to wait long. During the night, several German-type trucks entered the bridge with their lights on, followed by five tanks. Clearly, they were let through without any. In the middle of the bridge, soldiers, 60 Russian machine gunners, jumped out of the trucks and seized the crossing without difficulty. And all this a few hours after the visit of Russian tanks, which were able to make sure that on the opposite bank of the German troops are no longer there, and not seize the Russian bridge, the whole army could get a break, as the ice that covered the Don was too thin to withstand the tank. I have to agree with Fricky. Such carelessness can cost us dearly. What a story. It would be more understandable if the bridge, in order not to give it to the Russians, was blown up by the rearguard of our retreating troops. This has happened many times in military history. That is why in 1812 Marshal Ney had to cross on thin ice on the Berezina, and in 1813 Prince Poniatowski drowned near Leipzig. And here it is quite the opposite. The enemy is given a bridge, and thus the days that are so dear to us. Wasn't there any combat guard? No defensive positions except for the posts on the bridge? There were, but only on this side. Well, how absurd. There are heights on the other side of the Don. In any case, I would have installed an inductive detonator on the bridge. It would have worked at once and the matter would have become clear. Exactly, Mr. Captain. That's what we thought. Of course, we had to hold the bridge as long as possible. It would have been very useful for our breakthrough. But tell me, what kind of a breakthrough? Who's going to break through? Everyone? When? Do you know anything? Everyone's talking about an imminent withdrawal from the encirclement. In fact, that's why I came to see you. The whole army will break through every last soldier. Due to the shortage of fuel, we've been ordered to take only the most necessary equipment and weapons. Defective vehicles and weapons are to be blown up on the spot. Excessive ammunition, too. All writing, secret documents, etc. are to be burned. You gave the order to do that. A long time ago. Hmm. How could it be that it didn't reach me? Hey, it's your division's business. The date of the column formation hasn't been set yet. But we won't have long to wait. I'm no longer surprised by what I saw on the road. I tell Frick about the explosions and fires. No, Mr. Captain, he answers. The in all this has its own system. Commanders are left to decide what to take with them. I imagine that many divisions find it difficult to take even the essentials. After all, the shortage of fuel is enormous. In such cases, there is nothing left but to destroy new uniforms, quite usable weapons and vehicles on the move. Sad as it may seem, Fricker speaks of a huge route of exit from the encirclement. 380 to 420 kilometers, no less. As a goal is called Rostov. Further orders on the battle order will come later. In short, so far all this is a preliminary order. Army Group Command has approved the army presented a plan to get out of the encirclement, but the final decision is still pending. While the corps commanders, especially Ziedlitz and Hube, insist on its early adoption, Paulus is waiting for a radiogram from Oak. There is no time to lose. 
We must go as soon as possible. Every minute the order may come to my dugout and the battalion does not suspect anything. I quickly said goodbye to go immediately to the division headquarters. On the street I run into Oberlieutenant Langenkamp, the chief of radio communications of the 51st Corps. He is in as much of a hurry as I am. But still we exchange a few words. Interesting news I hear from this morning Zeditsitz, his corps commander, called a meeting of his first staff officers and told them this. We are facing the greatest defeat Germany has ever experienced. We have only one thing left, cans or brezins. Seidlitz's proposal to break through immediately was met in various ways. The result was open and covert criticism of both his plan and the corps commander himself. As the officers left the dugout, Langenkamp heard with his own ears how some officers resent. Old Pepper, it's time for him to retire. After the meeting Langenkamp was summoned to Ziedlitz, the general ordered immediately, despite the ban, to establish radio interception of all conversations of the army headquarters with the OK and the command of the army group and immediately report them to him. Responsibility, said the general, he takes on himself. He has as little time as I have. Saying goodbye, he said, done, running from one to another to get the ciphers. No one wants to help. The aviation liaison officer is my last hope. Razgulyayevka is full of cars. At the first staff officer gathered commanders of all parts of the division. Uh-huh. It's good that you showed up. Communication with you was interrupted. I couldn't get in touch. I arrived just in time to take part in the meeting. We are talking about preparations for a breakthrough in the general direction of Rostov. The regiments have already received their orders. All the special wishes of individual commanders are left unheeded. The first officer does not want to listen to anything. His every word is considered clear, categorical, nothing can be changed. Lieutenant Colonel Eichler, a short infantry commander, trying to get to listen to him, he fails. Finally, he is convinced that the only way out is not to rack his brains in vain and prepare for the march. But it's not easy to reconcile the idea of destroying weapons and ammunition. We all feel the same way. Zappa Battalion B.E. begins to read the next paragraph of the order of First Officer of the Headquarters. I take notes. What is being dictated to me does not particularly strike me. Prepared by the conversation with Fricky, I expected the worst. The division command requires that I take with me only flamethrowers and mines. Everything else is at my own discretion. I must provide my own fuel. No one will help me. The number of vehicles I can take depends on the amount. While after me such a surgical operation is performed on the commander of the reconnaissance battalion, I quickly make a preliminary calculation. My chief of material supplies broken Glock deserves all praise. Stocks of gasoline and diesel fuel, which he always carries with him illegally over the norm, will now serve us well. We will move at least a hundred kilometers farther than the division headquarters expect. Other units probably have the same situation. I know the commanders. A reserve has never been a bad thing for anyone. So let's take into account this reserve, calculate the number of kilometers, fuel consumption, some enough. For each soldier there is a place in the cars, I can take two field kitchens, enough food and blankets. For each two pieces, they can be very useful, and I'll still have some fuel left. I'm trying to call my battalion. Volga is listening. The connection is restored again. I call all the officers of the battalion, including Battalion Engineer von der Haiti, Treasurer Adirian, and Nuxnap Block. The journey from the nursery is rather long and tedious, but they will reach the flower pot in two hours. The first staff officer has already prepared all the orders, pushes his outline aside, and we approach the map, but before he emphasizes, we just have to prepare everything for destruction and blow it up by special order. Don't forget that, gentlemen, so that we'll be ready to act at any moment. No one knows when exactly that moment will come. There is no final order yet. What the other divisions do is none of our business. By 10-0 tomorrow, please report on the preparations made. Two hours later, the officers of my battalion are seated around me. The intendants from the nursery are also present. Pencils are running on paper. All are writing down the necessary orders. So I repeat, we take with us four cars, four motorcycles, Four trucks for transportation of personnel. Four trucks for ammunition, mines, flamethrowers, fuel, blankets and food. Two field kitchens. The exact loading and distribution lists for the vehicles are announced by order earlier. So it's clear. Gentlemen, 
Everything beyond these limits. Immediately prepare for explosion, weapons, ammunition, equipment, vehicles, uniforms, papers and other cargo. Jinjichai, think of your personal luggage. Every available space is precious to us. Hey, take everything out of the dugout so we can line up and move out within half an hour. Von der Heide, you're in charge of getting the vehicles ready to move out. And you, Glock, are in charge of fueling. Well, unit commanders will be briefed immediately. Make it clear to every single soldier. Report to me tomorrow morning by 9.0 a.m. On all preparations. Gentlemen, I emphasize once again. I forbid you to destroy anything without my orders. Any questions? Thank you. Officers and intendant with concerned faces leave the dugout. The destruction of my dugout comfort is in full swing. Washing facilities are already packed. Topographical and West Greece and scale maps of the area much further south are stacked in the tablet. Unfortunately, we were provided with maps only up to the Kotelnik, but he who seeks will find. It is not the first time we have to operate with only a geographical atlas and compass. We'll find a way out of it this time. Tony, standing on the table, tears a yellow air raid sign from the ceiling. We'll use it to cover the car's radiator. In the front of the dugout, Berger and Emi are packing their belongings. Everything that can be dispensed with goes into the stove. The fire has plenty of food today. For the last time, perhaps it gives us its beneficial warmth. Explosive charges are already stacked ready in the doorway to blow up the dugout on retreat. The miserable comfort is gone. Only a lamp, a bunk and a telephone still remind us that we lived, worked and slept here. Besides, there is still a radio. It too will be loaded on the car as soon as the order to retreat comes. It's time to think about my suitcase. There's no room for it in the car. Next to a change of clean linen and household goods are letters, some of which I have not yet had time to answer. I take them in my hands. Almost nine-tenths of them are from my wife. The thin, straight letters stare helplessly at me. They tell me of love and happiness, of fear and sacrifice. They cry out to me. I've been waiting for you for three years and you're still fighting? Come back soon. Life is so short. Think of your mother. She's so afraid for you. If it were up to me, I'd have been home long ago. I'm holding these pictures. Here is a picture of my wife when she was still a bride. Here after a year of our life together, and here are some new ones. They breathe a peaceful warmth. It's all in the past. The harsh reality does not want to know anything about this happiness, which shines on faces and peaceful landscapes. I quickly stuff my wallet with photos. The remaining ones I throw into the fire together with the letters. I throw the washcloths in there too. I can't help it. There's no room. Cameras, what do I do with them? Medesy. Tony, put these in the front compartment of the car. My God, you carry all sorts of things. Anything that's not absolutely necessary, I put aside for shirts and socks. This pile has to be destroyed as soon as the order to break out cut. Handkerchiefs, a dirk, a new uniform, boots, a photo album, and finally a telescopic sight. It's a trophy taken on the Don from a Russian sniper's rifle. It would serve me well on a hunting rifle. But now I have other worries, and the biggest one of all, no room. Tony comes in, tells me the car's ready to go. Fueled, jerry cans are full, the machine gun is installed, magnetic-shaped mines are put on the back seat, chains for the wheels are in order. The radiator is covered with an aircraft signal cloth. The only thing left to take is the briefcase and the clipboard. We're good to go. The night passes quietly. By 9.0 comes the last report on the execution of the order given. At 9.45, I report to the division headquarters on the readiness of the battalion for the performance. I put on my hat to go to the combat company. A few spot checks will give me confidence that my orders have been carried out. But then the telephone buzzer buzzes. Volga commander here. Von Schwerin speaking. The planned event is cancelled. Führer's orders. We what did I hear you? We're staying, and the Führer himself ordered this? J. Wool, an order from the Führer, is it possible to leave us surrounded? Thus, the sixth of whom he seems to think so highly of. He can't just write us off. Is there such a thing? Of course, we sometimes scolded him, a lot, often justly. But we were loyal to him in the end. An oath is an oath. And him, loyalty is a symbol of honor, doesn't it apply to him? And he just wants to cross us off his list. Didn't we give him everything we could? And now his gratitude, the gratitude of Fatterland? 
mad man, to ruin us all. I must have spoken too loudly. Mm. What happened, Mr. Captain? Burger, the breach is over. Hitler ordered us to stay. Well, now do you see that he's driving us to our deaths? It's a disaster like never before. Hey, but things can still get better. The Fuhrer himself is very interested in this. He won't leave an entire army to its fate. Berger, I told you yesterday that Paulus and the other generals are in favour of a breakthrough, and they know the situation better than anyone else. Why doesn't he listen to them? They're not stupid. Don't worry. The Fuhrer knows what he's doing. There must be a whole army moving east to rescue her. That's almost impossible. Can we wait that long? That's the question. Think about supplies, about our own ability to fight. Who will create a new front between Serafimovich and the Karmike steppe? There's a huge hole there. Someone has to stop the Russian offensive at last. And another thing. Are there sufficient forces available for an offensive to unblock us? Berger, be honest. You don't believe that either. Where would they come from all of a sudden? No, no, Berger. It's a disaster. That's right, Mr. Captain. But if there was no way to help us, why would the Fuhrer leave us here? As for his prestige, that's all. He opened his mouth too wide for Stalingrad. And now he can't go back lest he become a laughing stock. He wants to stay here at any cost. But Paulus stayed here, and if things were so hopeless, he would have radioed the OK. Berger, my dear, this is pointless. Paulus has already done it. If anything can help us, it's our own determination, our own strength. Paulus must act on his own. Gradually, it's getting darker in my dugout. Faint light penetrates here from outside, shrouding the edges and corners so that objects lose their outlines. The eye perceives only the transition from mouse grey tones to solid darkness. With twilight also comes a wholesome peace. Sleep rolls to the bunk. The tide of thought gradually subsides. The tide comes in. A few more small waves and then there is no more surf foam. Yes, I'm just a grain of sand in a huge hourglass that keeps turning upside down, and me with it. I can't help it. Whether I want to or not, whether I agree or protest, I can't stop it. So should I accept it, and let here, in Stalingrad, the hourglass remain forever motionless and the grains of sand cease to live? And but what does my opinion mean? What is it worth? Who asks if I want to go home, or stay here on the banks of the Volga forever? In a few weeks, when my turn comes, will there be someone else who will write to my wife that I died here in Stalingrad? Or after years of waiting, Will she carry the agony of the unknown with her to the grave? From such thoughts I feel completely broken, sick, weak, powerless. And yet I too bear some share of the blame. I don't know where this feeling comes from. Really, I can't change anything, I'm too small a grain of sand for that. But the guilt does not leave me. I reproach myself for having done too little. No, nothing to keep my wife from crying. And my mother will be in tears too. Since my father's death, my success, my joy and my happiness have become the meaning of her life. After all, I'm her only son. Without me, she will wither away. In her dying hour, she will curse the fate that has befallen her, and many other families will do the same. The Sixth Army is big, and the soldiers have even bigger families. And they will ask why no one had the courage to say what he thinks and act as his conscience dictates. They will not be comforted by the words order and obedience. And yet those words are the chain by which we are chained to this city. An entire army must be left to perish just because one man ordered it. That man is Hitler, and the multitude of men is us. And if there are a few among us who reject him, who disagree with him, and are ready to send him to hell, they all have different ideas about what should be done. Virtually everyone is left alone with their own thoughts. So why is this so? Because we've all been turned into mere executors of orders, into people whose thinking doesn't go beyond tactical tasks. Because we, the military, were kept away from politics, we were even deprived of the right to vote. And we still made a virtue out of this abstinence from politics. We were proud of the fact that we had nothing to do with politics. That is why we officers now stand so helplessly before these questions. But be that as it may, the masses are still obediently following this man. Whether out of fear or conviction, I don't know. If it were not so, all those who today march soldierly across Europe would not be following him. Yes, I will obey the order, even though I see what misfortune is coming upon us. This order nails an entire army to the ground. There will be as little left of it as Rath's platoon. But I am part of it, and I remain part of it, not only in times of victory, but also in times of trouble. 
and what is ordered must be done. That is the duty of every soldier. After all, I myself have always done so. From the first one to left to the military school, from the lieutenant mushy recruits to the battalion commander, can all this suddenly change for me just because now it is about my own life? Didn't I swear an oath that as a brave soldier, I will be ready at any moment to fulfill my oath at the cost of my own life? The oath is still valid today. Nothing has changed. Only I've changed. I'm beginning to wonder if the orders I'm given make sense. But even if I don't find it, I still obey, this time, so to speak, not with my arms stretched out at the seams, but with my fist in my pocket. And my soldiers, if they too, no longer understand the meaning of orders, how should I deal with them? Again the phone buzzed. This is the vulgar commander. Hmm. Please don't leave the phone. I'll connect you with Mr. General. Well, what will the old man say? Maybe something has changed in the situation. Von Schwerin. The Volga commander is at the machine. Hey, I'm glad I caught you in person. The Führer's orders are not to be discussed. It's very clear. It can't be helped. We'll have to wait. The division will remain in its original positions for the time being. I just wanted to let you know that things are changing for your battalion. The situation calls for the combat utilization of every single soldier. That's why the sappers have to be in the front line. You'll receive detailed orders tomorrow. I expect the whole battalion to be as good as before.